Um, I've got a friend in, um, in Jerusalem. Uh, he's an old resistance fighter from, from Europe called Israel Shahak, who now lives in Israel and defends the human and the national uh, rights of the Palestinians. And whenever I call him up and say, how are things? He's prone to reply, well, Christopher, he says, there are encouraging signs of polarization. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that he knows how to think that way, and, and most people don't, and are afraid of confrontation and um, of polarization, and in indeed always use those words as if they were pejorative, whereas if you can claim to be a healer or a unifier, you're axiomatically privileged in American society, should make us wonder why it is that actually the consensus has somewhat managed to absorb this movie. It seems to me people underestimate all the time the fantastic equipment of shock absorption that this consensus has. Now, I would say having... The book drove me to read the autobiography again and to read James Baldwin's original script for the first time and also to read another book that's very interesting, which is Spike Lee's own compilation of the book of the movie, contains a lot of the original interviews he did. And I think I, I, I'd like to offer just some reasons why I think the consensus has absorbed it. Partly that's by the will of the critics and most people who write in this country, because when they can absorb, when they can say that something is healing or entertaining, they will. And partly I think it is Spike Lee's fault uh, that, that it was so easily assimilable into the general wet blanket of cultural discussion in, in the United States. Um, if you consider the autobiography, the, uh, the movie interview book that's just called X, you can get in any bookstore paperback, and the Baldwin script, you'll find four important things I think that are missing. Um, or have been rendered blandly. Uh, some critics point out there are some autobiographical details. I think my comrade on the right is quite correct in saying there's much too much show-off stuff of the early pimp days, the, the Malcolm Little days. Partly that's also to give Spike Lee a chance to show off in his zoot suit, let's not forget. <laughs> which which won an Oscar nomination. Which won an Oscar nomination, yeah. <laughs> which is the bit that gets the Oscar, which I wasn't displeased to see. It was quite fun and so on. <laughs> then there are things where we, we, even those of us who admire him, can't be certain that the author of the autobiography was telling the truth about his father um, and about the torching of his own house, which is blamed on other black militants, possibly rightly, possibly not, maybe was uh, self-inflicted torching, where is th these are just done uncritically. Th these are where it's too authentic in following the book. Too faithful, I mean to say. Then there is the relationship between Malcolm X and two very interesting and very diverse political groups way outside the American consensus. The first of these is the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, a Trotskyist internationalist Marxist group with which Malcolm X was working increasingly closely at the time he was murdered, which was considered to the left of the left and was very much persecuted by the communist and fellow traveling consensus, which had a large part in the, um, the soft center of the civil rights movement. A hard internationalist group with which, he, especially in Harlem, he was moving to have relations. The second out group is, of course, the Nation of Islam. Now, since Spike Lee put Farrakhan into Do the Right Thing, where he really had basically no place, no business, what, and Spike Lee gave has in the book of the movie a very long and very tough interview with Farrakhan about his relations with Malcolm X and where the question comes up Farrakhan called in his papers and uh, other editorials in the same papers called for the murder of Malcolm X and this is discussed and confronted by Spike Lee who used also the Nation of Islam's youth movement as security for the movie how come that he just dodges the whole question how come that the, you wouldn't know there was such a person then or now, and there's both, in the whole film? How come that this, this hard, sharp question is simply left out? We know that Mr. Lee knew of its presence there. Now, I think that if you do leave out these things, there are rewards from critics who say how much you are maturing and how increasingly you earn your place in the respectable consensus, and indeed you may get Academy Award nominations, but you cannot complain if the, if the big embrace moves around to say, well, at least you know how to avoid confrontation. The only thing that brings life to politics or to thought. I, for, oh. <laughs> um, could I just, sure. I just want to ask you a clarifying question. Um, I, think I think I know what you mean about uh, Jefferson and Sally and so on, but I, mm -hmm. I think, would you say it was the same thing that you would have a very hard time getting uh, a film dramatization of J. Edgar Hoover's tapes of Martin Luther King in the motel onto TV now, either. And if... You... 
you, oh, I'm sorry. Christopher, it's very hard sorry. to hear you. <clears throat> if I'm not audible, I'm, I was just taking a um, medical repeater. You probably would. I mean, people would get very upset Maybe I have the whether or not they would be able to, to, to stop it. I don't know, but I do know that people, probably the King people, and I'm assuming this because they gave up so much to get that holiday that I'm not quite sure what else they're prepared to give up to get a movie. Uh, uh, I mean, on the real Martin Luther King as opposed to the I Have a Dream Martin Luther King. I mean, yeah. they gave up a tremendous amount on him to get the holiday. So I'm not sure what else they would give up in order to get a well, movie I mean, done. I mean, the other night on PBS, there was, in effect, um, footage of um, J. Edgar Hoover in a dress uh, as a transvestite hooker in the, in the Plaza Hotel. Well, there was which not is actually, in effect. You know, well, in, there were hints. Of there this. was more than no, there was more than hints. There was, uh, there was testimony from living witnesses. I thought it was the perfect revenge for Hoover's uh, prurient uh, taping of other people. I thought it was, uh, as is Anthony Summers' book. And I bet after, you that will end up in a movie. Which is I after, think we'll see J. Edgar Hoover well, yeah, in a dress. I think, that, I think we will see J. Edgar Hoover in a, in a little, nice black little number strutting up and down. <laughs> it will happen. And the reason I'm saying this is not, the reason I'm saying this is I do think actually all these things are not only possible, but, but um, probably necessary. Well, I don't think you can, to me, you can't compare. See, J. Edgar Hoover has been exposed when you're talking about Malcolm X to me, as a black person, then with a white person, you're talking about, you know, Thomas Jefferson. I don't, I, you don't compare Malcolm X with J. Edgar Hoover. Right, fair enough. You know, and uh, if you're going to compare him, you compare him with Thomas Jefferson's and the George Washingtons and the, you know, the uh, the Robert E. Lees, you know, and those kind of people, and how they are treated, the lies that have been told about them in movies and books to, and to glamorize them and everything. For centuries, these lies have been told. Um, I feel lucky in having gotten to know Brother Malcolm is that I personally don't have to look upon him, you know, as a myth, as a god. I can see him as a great black man, not a great man, as a great black man. I may say that I saw a very, I saw a very agreeable thing. I went with Walter Mosley to see it in New York, the showing. And I saw something I'd, I'd like to see more often, real fear on the faces of Warner Brothers executives and publicity people who were sort of guarding the entrance to the cinema. They really thought that night might end in some kind of a, of a, of a this riot. This was the night of the opening. Yeah, yeah. and it was amazing to see, and, and I realized how much I like to see publicity people look frightened. Um, and, <laughs> and I don't see it enough. And th then I realized that, in, f in fact, of course, that it's, it was all in their minds. It must be some kind of guilt complex, I suppose. They don't think the subject can come up without the threat of violence. That's a, that is a compliment of a kind to the subject. But I, the, the fact is, you wouldn't know from seeing the movie why that really potent uh, factor in the thing exists. I want to challenge Peter uh, Williams on something, if I, if, unless I'm, unless I'm um, no, uh, you usurping wanna... my... Or someone else's time. No, I just wanted to hear Peter on this, right. on this point, and then Bailey. Well, see, I think that... I think that it shows, number one, uh, you know, as we like to say that, you know, those black people who come from my perspective, that trying to be acceptable has its limitations. Uh, I mean, not only in making movies, but in other areas. That's why we don't spend a lot of time trying to be acceptable. But we face some realities of people who want to ask questions. Okay. And I think maybe some of our other points will come out through the answers to what I hope will be the brief questions that will be stated. And, and Christopher, I promise we'll get back to the point you want to make. Uh, so tell us who you are and ask a quick question, please. My name is Aaron Brickman. I'm a student here at AU in the School for International Service. Uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, I agreed with most of what you said uh, up until the point about uh, Jewish Americans. Um, unfortunately, I lost all respect for you as soon as you said that. I would like you to expand on the point about Jews that we don't know about. What, in your mind, do we not know about the Jews of this country, sir? Well, you know, first of all, I simply, your losing respect for me does not cause me a lot of problems. But, uh, uh, but you do owe him an answer. What I said was, what I said was that, that the Jewish community in this country is very, very powerful. And, I'm not, and, and I admire that power because they are able to protect and defend their interests. And if we could only do it in the same way, and their movies, you see all the time when we, uh, about the, the Jewish community fighting to, to, to keep certain things uh, in the history books, 
when people start challenging the, the, the Holocaust uh, and writing things that are, that are different, with, they go after them tooth and nails. And, when, and I want to make it very clear, I am not criticizing that. I think that is exactly what a group has to do to protect its interests. I'm only saying that we, and by we I mean black people, should follow that same strategy when promoting and defending our interests in this society. That's all I am saying. Why don't you answer the question, Pierre? He said to you, what don't we know about Jewish people in America? What don't we know about Anglo-Saxon people? What don't we know about black people? That's not a question. Okay. What don't we know about Jewish people? What is, what is, what are you saying? Sir, all I was asking was for you to answer the direct question. Okay, then what, what don't we know about Jewish people? What don't we know about black people? What don't we know about Anglo-Saxons? What don't we know about Polish people? I mean, there are a lot of things that we don't know about a lot of people in this country. I don't really understand. I personally, I'd be very, I'm serious. I do not understand the question. Well, if, if, you I, can may, make it clear if I may me, interpret. Pat, I have no problems answering it if someone will make it clear. Pat, step well, in. It seemed to me that what he was saying is that you raised the point, you said, you said in an earlier uh, statement, mm -hmm. there are things that you could not portray in a film about Jewish people in America. And I think he was asking, what are those things? Okay, I want to ask you a question. Could I, as a black filmmaker, make a film in this country that said that uh, the Holocaust is a myth? Could I, as a black filmmaker, make a film that even suggests that? What would that be telling people about Jews that they didn't know? Can, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, wait, I'm asking, I'm asking that question. Is, but I don't think you're answering the question that, asks, that has been asked now by two people of you to explain, to further explain the statement that you made. You made a statement. Why won't you answer the question about the statement you made? I don't, what, I don't understand the question. <laughs> what about Jewish people we don't I, know? What? You said that. You're the one who I said that. I did not say that. Well, in that case, I think <laughs> okay. we can move on. I think we should probably yeah. just go I think on. we're going to move on. Let me close very quickly. I Let think me just we're going to move on. I was, what I was saying, I was, what I was saying, if it was misinterpreted, I was saying I was admiring the ability and the power of the Jewish people in this country to promote and defend their interests. I think we'll That's what I was doing. I think we'll take that as a clarification okay. and move on to the next question. Uh, indicate my uh, slight but um, I hope noticeable dissent. Look, everybody knows what a serious topic this is. We're talking about the struggle for liberation of the only large group of people who did not come to America of their own free will and who used to be property. Okay? You would, I think, be surprised how many people have got that point. Uh, and realize and appreciate the seriousness of it. The difference I have with you is <clears throat> really when you say that if, it's, if, the, if there's anything good in the movie, it's Brother Lee. If there's anything bad, it is Warner Brothers. I've not heard Mr. Lee say, I'd have made a better film if Warner Brothers didn't give me 40 million bucks. If he wants to say it, he has enough money, and I would hope enough courage to say so. I also think that you're in danger when you say all, all art is propaganda, of basically saying that all propaganda is art or would be considered artistic by you, as long as it was made by black people. Now, no, that, well, no. that's what you said, or in, that's what you were, broadly, you were broadly hinting, that no one else's opinion was of very much interest to you, which is, of course, you're right. But I'll give you an example from the movie and the autobiography that will face you, if I'm correct, with a choice. Mm -hmm. On the chickens coming home to roost, which you said you thought tactically should not have been said, the, in my view, perfectly brilliant speech made, by Malcolm X about the murder of Kennedy and what it meant in terms of the culture of assassination and destabilization. You said tactically you'd rather that hadn't been made. Actually, the real trouble in real life that Malcolm X got into was over saying that he didn't care about the, the crash of a plane load of uh, white travel agents in Chicago because why should he care about a plane load of crackers, which I think you'll agree is a different statement culturally and intellectually from saying that there was some revenge involved in the, to the culture of violence in the murder of the president. Now. In the movie, there is a moment, which everyone remembers, where a young, concerned, honky woman of the kind we're all used to condescending to, and anyone who can, talk, who can pronounce the word empowerment knows how to despise people like this. She comes up to, to Malcolm and his group at Columbia, and she says, look, uh, I would really like to do something to help, and I'd like to know what it is. And he says, nothing. There's nothing you can do. She turns away. And Spike Lee, who dodges all really important political questions in the film, is not above sending racial thrills of this kind through audiences. 
And so I thought it was appalling that that story, which indeed appears in the autobiography, is only told in the autobiography because Malcolm X says he wishes he now knew where that girl was because he, he wished he hadn't said that to her and he wished he could find her and talk to her. Has little more respect for the opinions of some white people say than, than you do, uh, to, make, to make my point direct. Um, and is not going to make innuendos about whether they're Anglo-Saxon, Polish or Jewish either. In other words, isn't a tribalist. Now, if I ask you this question, do you think that Malcolm X was right to say that in his book about the girl? And if you don't think you mean so, right why not? right to say that he was sorry. That, that he was he... sorry. And do you agree that's what he did say? And if not, why not? And if that is the state of affairs in the book, is it Warner Brothers' fault that Spike Lee opens that quotation mark in the film and then fails to close it again and leaves people with a, a deformed impression of what the politics of the movie and indeed this discussion really are? Well, I think that... that... He, I, he himself said that he was sorry he made that statement. Yes. Malcolm X did say, and I have the statement that he made, that those whites who are sincere, this is a change, should work in their own communities. That's what he said. He said that he found that those whites, quote, who accepted Islam, end of quote, had been able to transcend racism. We've got to be very careful about what he said about this. So what he did, which by making that statement about sincere, but you would be surprised. I, can't, I worked in the movement in the 60s. What a difficult time that we had getting that concept through to white people. They all wanted to work in Harlem. And we kept telling them, go to Bayside, go to Bensonhurst. Organize out there. That's where you can organize. We can't go out there. They didn't want to hear it. They wanted to come to Harlem. And I tell you very frankly, we, we, we regarded that as a missionary uh, concept and we resented it tremendously mm -hmm. and 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 the change in brother Malcolm from what he was saying when he was in the nation and what he said with the OEAU was his statement that those whites who were sincere should organize and work in their own communities because this is where the problem was and where they could be most effective there were not going to be any white members of the OAAU the organization of Afro-American unity that I can guarantee you oh. You know, they have to be absolutely correct. They have to be absolutely perfect. And I think that that's unrealistic to look at anybody in that manner. And I think what we need to begin to do is to start to look at the good in people and the goodness that they do and see if we can uplift humanity, black people in particular and all people in general. And I think when we start to look at things from that perspective, we begin to get more things done in this society. Right here in Washington, the last four years, we've had 2,500 people killed. Uh, we have 200,000 people unemployed or underemployed. 30% of our population is on public assistance. Only 30,000 people make over $60,000 uh, in a book. 11,000 people on a five and a half year waiting list for public housing. The list goes on and on and on. So I'm saying dialogue is good. Dialogue has its place. But the thing that I take from Malcolm, the thing that I take from Martin Luther King is a commitment for activism, a commitment to be involved, a commitment to change and bring some things about. I can't really imagine Malcolm X or Martin Luther King sitting on a panel even discussing a the movie. They would be somewhere trying to change and bring about <laughs> the, uh, well, the uplifting of our society. I'll I'll take the blame for the fact that people are here on the panel. Oh, no, it's a good form. I, 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 I'm not But we to trust that they will do important other it's, things. It's, 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 it's well. a real good form, and, you know, this is my model, and you have so many no, people understand. on this panel that I, I really love and respect. I really do. I, I think time for criticism and all of that is, 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 is way past. I'm just saying that the problems in Washington and the problems of America is going to require that all of us begin to kind of, like, get involved and see what we have in common rather than always what we don't have in common. Always criticizing each other, always at each other's throats. You know, we're in a real serious time in our society, but we've got some major problems. And I'd just like to see us come together. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I think one of the reasons for the disappointment felt by audiences who've seen the film and for the, for the absence of a... <clears throat> the lasting effect that some might have hoped for from it is precisely to do with the question that was just asked. In fact, where does it take you? For example, I mean, one Williams mentioned, mentioned this, but he could, have been, he could have been, he could have extended his remarks and said, you know, family values, abstinence from alcohol and drugs, sexual continence, 
Small business was another aspect of it. I've read countless articles in the conservative and Reaganite press in the recent months saying, why aren't more black people like Malcolm X? And these are not all of them are trying to be funny or trying to be teasing. Indeed, they are saying, in one of my least favorite terms at the moment, as a role model, uh, McPeel might do well to emulate him. Now, if it's as easily, if his points were as easily assimilable as that, then I don't think one can count him as a revolutionary. Um, on the business of Islam, it's been proved by every society that's tried it that Islam is not a basis on which you can organize a, a society. In fact, no religion can ever organize a state or a nationality. That's been proved by Christians time and again. There are many experiments going on now of different kinds of Islam. All of them are either failing or have failed calamitously. So as far as a preacher of Islam uh, is concerned, not a success. I would, however, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, and I almost feel that uh, I have an emanation of feeling ridiculous from my, from my uh, skeptical neighbor, um, Peter Bailey. But if you ask me, what does Malcolm X mean to me? And if you can suppress your titters, I can say this much. Everywhere you look in the world at the moment, whether it might be Bosnia um, or Haiti or uh, the former Soviet Union or, the, or West Germany, now unified Federal Republic of Germany, you can see there are always basically two kinds of people. There are those who think that the tribe into which they were born is the main thing about themselves and nothing can change that. And the main, if they could only like themselves more for it, congratulate themselves more about it, they would be only too happy. And there are people who realize that internationalism is not just a desirable thing, it's actually the only way the world can be organized, and in practical terms, is the only way it can be. And there are people who've had the experience of crossing that gulf. And, and, making, and Malcolm X, who had had everything that white racism could throw at him, refused to let the racists be his teachers. And that is why his example, in, in, the, in the moral and exemplary sense, is undimmed. And that, I think, would be um, an excellent way in which to remember him as, as an example of a road along which a lot of people have still got a lot of traveling to do.